Hi, and welcome back to the Shane Place series of the White Plume Mountain Notes as I take my uh, party of adventurers through White Plume Mountain, updated to 5th edition in Tales from the Awning Portal, which is uh, seven classic adventures updated to 5th edition. Uh, if you're new to this video series, really appreciate you um, watching. If you're returning, thanks for being a continuing viewer. I really, really enjoy doing this video series and all the interaction it gets, and I, I constantly get comments that it's helpful to people. So really enjoy doing it, and thanks for coming along for the ride. Uh, if you are new to this video series, it's not just, uh, hey, here's what happened ABC in White Plume Mountain. I also try to offer notes kind of in general on D&D rules and, uh, you know, kind of trying to let you inside my head as a dungeon master, how I dungeon master things. So it's kind of a kind of a mix of a lot of stuff, but the majority of it is is going through White Plume Mountain. So uh, when we last left our adventurers, they had just finished with uh, Snarla and Burkett in the spinning cylinder in their little guard post area, and they're about to head north to the flood doors and to the magic force field bubble that has the giant crab in it. And that is, of course, what we get to in this video. But first, let's do viewer feedback. So I'm going to put on my plus three spectacles of viewer feedback, and let's see what there is to see from video 15. So, and I do appreciate your feedback. So, um, you know, feel free to free to comment either positively and negatively or ask questions or whatever you would like to do here. So let's take a look at what we got. Uh, first, it looks like Sonic Halo. And there was two or three people who commented on this. So I'll, I'll try to mention everybody at the same time here uh, for efficiency. I had thought out loud last video because Snarla is is a lycanthrope a werewolf who also cast spells and i was like well, can werewolf cast spells uh you know and i kind of thought out loud and i was like i don't think i've seen anything specifically says they can't etc and we had several uh responses uh similar to sonic halos but here's sonic halos he said okay i just looked through the lycanthrope section in the monster manual and there's no rule saying they can't cast spells while transformed the only limitation would be they can't speak while in their pure animal form, but not their hybrid form. Um, so I would run it as a lichen spellcaster can cast while in their hybrid form. And he said, so that's a bit of evil DM fun with a kind of a, um, you know, like who, you know, her, her emoji. Uh, yeah. And then Scrage Grimclaw said ditto uh, to Sonic Halo's comment. And yeah, that's the conclusion I ended up coming to. Um, you know, lycanthropes basically have their humanoid form, uh, a hybrid form, which is like what we think of as a werewolf of, you know, like a, a wolf man kind of thing, half man, half wolf. Um, and then the pure animal form, which is they're the wolf. Uh, so they can cast spells while they're humanoid and in their hybrid form, but not in their pure animal form because their pure animal, animal form can't speak. So, um, who else commented on that? Several people did. Um, let's see if I can catch that right there. I'll get everybody at the same time. I know more than one person commented on that. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Well, I guess not. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I guess I'll catch them here in a second. Yeah, Ethan D. almost co also commented on that. Said lycanthropes have three forms, humanoid, hybrid, and animal. I believe the lycanthrope can cast in both humanoid and hybrid. The stat block says that none of the statistics change in hybrid form except their AC. So I'd rule that spell casting is included as part of their stats and remain unchanged in hybrid form. Uh, animal form limits their actions more, though, so I don't think you can cast in full animal form. Agreed. So, um, and then Ethan also said, hey, I'm curious if you remembered the lycanthrope damage immunities. They're pesky because they're immune to non-magical piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing damage from weapons that aren't silvered. Uh, it sounds like it was a pretty easy fight for your players, so I'm curious if they just have enough magic weapons that it wasn't a problem, or if you didn't notice the immunities. I frequently forget about resistances and immunities myself, so uh, I, I definitely, I think all DMs do that like, later like oh yeah that monster was immune or resistant or da 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 you forget even though you kind of read before the fight and kind of go through everything uh, you get caught up in the moment and forget uh but no this in this case that the parties has gotten powerful enough and weapon wise and all that that it wasn't an issue but i did remember the immunities uh in that fight and they still were able to make short work for the most part of snarla you, you may remember i actually kept snarla up a little bit longer just to give her a chance to do one round where she got the 
furious rage attacks with advantage. So, okay, um, let's see. Okay, Scrage Grimclaw, who also said ditto to the Lycanthrope stuff when Sonic Halo posted, uh, said, hey, Shane, great video. Really waiting to hear how your group is going to take on the boiling bubble. Um, how are you going to run it, by the way? A roll of one with a slashing or piercing is going to run their day, or are you going to spare them the misfortune and only punish bad ideas? I said, also, I think that maybe you should buff the crab because seven people are going to destroy him, maybe two crabs. Um, and and you'll, you'll see how I ran that later in this video, but I did... Fumbles came into a little bit, but not straight fumbles. And then I did buff the crab, but I did not do two crabs. But I buffed the crab a little bit. And also the tactics of the crab. You know, I, I just tried to make it slightly more challenging. But still, yeah, the, the crab was not the main danger. Uh, you know, the the precarious nature of that force field bubble is is much more of a challenge, in my opinion, than, than, than the crab is. Um, and I said, I'll definitely increase challenges with fight. Not sure yet if there's more opponents or buffing the crab instant death won't be capricious but based on combination of choices actions and roles that was my response to the comment but you'll see here in the video how i actually handled it okay i also asked about homebrew versus uh pre-made content on last video if people had a preference um i said i didn't i didn't really have a preference either way me personally however i normally do pre-made stuff just due to i don't really have a lot of time to do a lot of homebrew um, although I'm going to homebrew the ending of White Plume Mountain a little bit. So, uh, Leah Williams, who's actually Wes Taylor, uh, you'll, you'll see, uh, in the comment thread and, and Wes Taylor is the DM who ran the Greyhawk initiative, um, one shot that I did. You go check that video out. I, I really recommend it. It's a good video on, on the very optional play testy Greyhawk initiative, but uh, there is a video on the channel on that. Uh, and, um, Leah Williams said, I think writing adventures are best. I think written adventures are best if you add enough homebrew. So f players feel connected to the story. So I think, and then, and I said, Oh, thanks for the comment. And then Leah, Leah said, just so you know, that is Wes Taylor making the comment. He just happens to be logged in my account. <laughs> so, okay, Leah. Um, and, okay. So Wes, uh, basically was saying that, you know, the pre-written stuff is great. Like, you know, Tales from the Outing Portal or Out of the Abyss or whatever, but add enough homebrew to it to kind of connect the players to the, uh, the the story. You know, homebrew it just enough so it's kind of custom for them, I think, is, is what we're saying there. Uh, Gerald Cruz, who is actually one of my players that just had to leave due to circumstances beyond his control, said, one day Grim Gorth will return and he will 1v1 again. And that's sort of an in-joke in my party. And I said, 1v1! So, Gerald, you're always welcome back. Sorry that you got caught in the whirlpool of life uh, and had to leave the group. But I appreciated your very kind comments on the way out. Okay, Bill Hart said, Hi, Shane. Thanks for another great video. I love your ruling on the spinning cylinder. And he's referring, I, I kind of homebrewed or did some custom rules on the spinning cylinder and people staying in it longer than one round. Um, he said, I plan on using the same rules that make perfect common sense. I said, impressed with a lot of your rulings and descriptions of how you handle each encounter slash room in White Plume Mountain. These videos are great teach teaching tools for any DM planning to run White Plume Mountain. I've also thought about doing average monster damage, uh, but I love rolling dice just like my players do. Plus, my players always seem to hang on the edge of their seats on how much is this attack going to hurt their characters. Um... Keep up the great work, Shane. He said, Bilbo the DM, one of the original DMs, has been rolling since 1977. So good to hear from you again, Bill. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of tinkering around with, since I have a larger group, you know, running like seven, eight people. I think we're down to an average of seven right now. Um, but, you know, we've been upwards of 10 or 11 at times. And those were just some, you know, I, I'd read some tips from like Matt Mercer and Chris Perkins and others on running large groups. And, and, and one of them was do the average monster damage because it helps move things along. Um, and so I did that for like one during video 15, that, that play session. I did that uh, just to see kind of how it worked and how it felt. Um, it did speed things up, but I agree with Bill and his players that it's fun to roll the dice. And I love the knuckle biting drama of a dice roll. 
it could go great, it could go bad. It, there's something about that knuckle-biting drama of a dice roll. So I'm probably not going to do average damage a lot. Uh, I, I certainly won't do it for all my damage. But there, for the fight with uh, Burkett and Snarla, um, you know, I went ahead and I said, well, I'm just going to do average damage and see how it feels. And, I, you know, I, it... it it wasn't bad, you know, it worked, it worked fine, but yeah, I'm, I'm with Bill, I want to roll the dice, I want to, I want to see what happens, I want the, the drama of it all, the suspense, so, um, and then Bill also said, uh, Shane, without a doubt, using the average damage will speed up the game a little, I actually deal a larger than average group as well, as well, uh, it feels weird if I only have four players at the table, I know what that feels like, Bill. Uh, I usually have six to ten players, but I place the game. I pace the game to my speed. I want to enjoy the moment of telling the story and not rushing encounters. I feel listening to all of your videos that you also pace your game at your speed and take in the moment of storytelling. I do try. Um, that may be the reason I make sure to listen to each of your videos each week. Keep up the great work of storytelling and DMing. Again, Bill, thanks for your kind comments. I, um, you know, I hope that people get benefit out of out of, you know, hearing me talk about, hey, here's how to do Out of the Abyss or White Plume Mountain or whatever, you know, and of course, I always don't do things perfect, so hopefully people also learn from what I, you know, sometimes it'll be like, I feel like I did that wrong, or I could have done it differently, or in hindsight, had I known, you know, I would have done whatever, so but anyway, I do, I do appreciate your comments, Bill, um, very kind of you. Cody Lloyd said, hey, Shane, great video, I'm excited that Out of the Abyss will be returning soon, um, not sure if this is where I should post this, but I, I had told you at a Comic-Con, and, and I, wrote into, I ran into Cody and his little brother at a Comic-Con, Little Rock Comic-Con, that I was going to start running D&D at my local game store. Things are going good. We have only met twice, as I only run once a month. Uh, I agree with the way you run the monsters damage. I had eight players in my last session, and it just made it easier on me and also a bit more challenging for my players to take the average. There is that. If you take the average, you know... Uh, it does, in a, in a sense, add challenge because, you know, it takes low rolls out. You know, you're going to take the the middle damage no matter what. Um, I said, hey, Cody, glad to hear your games in a way. And, yeah, totally, people tell me about the games you're running. That's totally fine to post that here in the video comments. I uh, love to hear that stuff. So, okay, uh, Mahad Harmapala. I hope I pronounced that right. If I didn't, I apologize. So thanks for posting the series. I started D&D back in the 70s and played through the 80s. This really takes me back watching what happens every week. Keep up the great work. Hey, man. Uh, thanks, Mahad. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I, you know, I hope you get to playing again. It sounds like that maybe you're not playing right now. You're just watching the videos and things, which is fine, you know, uh, but I hope you get you pick up the dice again someday. That'd be really super cool. Um, okay, and I hope you keep watching. So, um Rob Plummer said, hey, Shane, for me, when I was young and running AD&D, I used to homebrew a little uh, and ran module, module, modules, I guess, muddy adventures, modules. Nowadays, as an adult and full-time job, there is no time for me to do homebrew content. Uh, so written adventure campaign is the only way I run now. I like it. I don't mind. Great video again, as always. Yeah, I, th I think that the written stuff out there, especially the stuff that's been coming out in 5th edition, has been great. You know, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, I, there, you know, there might be some bad stuff out there in the DMs Guild or whatever. But everything I've seen for Fifth Edition from Wizards of the Coast has been great. So, you know, you can have a lot of fun with pre-written stuff. But I mean, I've I've been blown away by what people have done with homebrew as well. Um, you know, one of the adventures that I did way back in the day that I had one of my that I felt some of the best player reaction ever. I just homebrewed it. I just threw something together. Um, you know, so yeah, there's a lot to be said for both. Okay, Chris said, Shane, I'm really enjoying this series and I finally caught up. I was excited when I found out that you were going to cover White Plume Mountain because I was also planning on breaking up my Out of the Abyss campaign with White Plume Mountain or another adventure from Tales from the Awning Portal. As much as I've enjoyed watching this, the, the one main thing I'm taking away is that I will probably not run White Plume Mountain. I wanted to insert a two or three session above land break in quotes for my players before pulling them back into the depths. You have helpfully shown me that running White Plume Mountain in only two or three sessions is just not possible. And he puts in parentheses, especially for my group. As fun as this adventure sounds, I think I'm going to look for another quicker side adventure and try to run White Plume Mountain as part of a separate campaign in the future. Knowing how long this has taken, would you do it again? Um, 
Watching this has been very helpful. Thank you for sharing. I'm really looking forward to Out of the Abyss Part 2. Out of the Abyss Part 2 is coming soon, folks. I get a lot of comments about that. Yeah, we've, I've, within the next couple of weeks, we should probably be back into the Abyss. So um, he said, P.S. or perhaps off topic, do you or anyone else here have any other ideas for short side adventures that fit well between Out of the Abyss? Okay, so here's my reply. I said I would run it again, but not as a quick side adventure. You know, I, it, it, this has taken me a little longer to run it than I anticipated. Uh, I said your best bet would probably be to check the DMs Guild, and I'm talking about, you know, he's looking for a short side adventure. Now, one thing I will say on Out of the Abyss, keep in mind that, uh, you know, we run, uh, you know, two, two and a half hours once a week. Um, and I also added a full intro session on the front of the game where they were at the Yawning Portal and the end of the Yawning Portal and did the adventure hooks, got them to the village for White Plume Mountain. And they didn't, they didn't even go into White Plume Mountain the very first, you know, those first two, three hours right there. Um, and then, you know, we've we've had, a uh, you know, they've, they've left the mountain a couple of times, gone back in. So I, I guess if, if somebody was doing a weekly four or five hour session, you could probably knock White Plume Mountain out in two or three, in, in maybe three sessions, two or three sessions. If you just got in there and just hammered at it, it's possible. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the way I've been doing it, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, like I said, this is video 16. <laughs> so, uh, but there was a little bit of fluff in there that could have been removed. Uh, and again, we didn't have, so if you think of, we play two and two hours on average, uh, 15 times two, what 30. So we're, we're 30 something hours in this, you know, uh, let's say divide that by five, say five hour sessions. Well, that's six, five hour sessions right there. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody would take as long to play it as we do, but I, I think that if you, if you had just a hardcore, um, veteran group of players and you, you had like, you were playing like four or five hour sessions, which is kind of a typical D and D session. Um, and you just hammered at it. Then, you know, I, I think, I think it's possible to knock it out in like three sessions, but I, I don't know. Uh, be curious to hear how long it's taken other people. And also people, if you have, um, any advice or thoughts for Chris on where to get some, uh, quick side adventures, uh, I know that there's, you know, you can get, there's adventures out there that are 5e compatible that are not necessarily from wizards of the coast. And then also there's the DMs guild that just has a ton of adventures and stuff like you just go their PDF form and, and you know, you, the people can revenue share with wizards of the coast and they get half the profit from whatever sold. So in, in it stuff's variable. There's probably some fantastic stuff on there, but there's probably some stuff on there that, you know, is not good. So it, it just kind of depends, check the reviews and stuff like that. Um, all right, let's see what else we have here. Okay, got uh, one last comment on video 15. Ethan D. Um, said, hey, Shane, looks like others have weighed in. Okay, well, we've already talked about Ethan's comment here with the uh, with the lycanthrope and the uh, damage immunities and all that. So that is the viewer feedback uh, for video 15. And I'm going to take off my plus three spectacles of viewer feedback, and we will launch into the recap from last session okay so first thing uh you know usually before i get into the blow by blow i'll sometimes talk about uh like rules um like rules clarifications and stuff maybe that came up um uh during the last session and one thing that that is interesting that i found out that you know my, my in my I, th I thought the rule worked this way Everybody in my group thought the rule worked this way, but we're wrong by the rules. Rules as written. Now you can house rule it. But rules as written, you can't end your move, not your turn, but your move in another creature's space, whether they're friendly or hostile. Okay? So the, the, the general rule in D&D in is that... Uh, you can't move through an occupied space that an enemy is in, that a hostile person's in. And only certain special, uh, like if you're a halfling, you know, you can, you can, uh, move under, you know, if you're smaller or whatever, 
uh, they get kind of a, a special rule there. But for the most part, unless there's a spell or special ability or something in, in effect, you cannot move through a hostile enemy space. You can move through a friendly creature space. All right? No, not a problem. We've always played it uh, that you just can't end your turn in that space. But no, you can't end the move in that space. And the reason that's important is because we've had, and this came up from Jeremy Crawford, who wrote, who's like the the main name on the player's handbook. He's like, and does a lot of rules answers and stuff for Wizards of the Coast. He's one of the core designers for D&D from Wizards of the Coast. I mean, this guy, you know, knows what he's talking about. Lead designer. D&D lead designers are Mike Merles and Jeremy Crawford, and the player's handbook lead was Jeremy Crawford. So this is the guy who's saying this. He said, it's, you can in a move, it's not the turn. So we've been playing it like in certain situations where, uh, like if you're in a narrow space and there's a couple of uh, party members fighting monsters, then if you have enough movement, you can run up to where they are and then attack and then just move back out to an empty space before your, uh, before your turn's over. That's incorrect. If you go to page 191 of the player's handbook, it says... You can move through a non-hostile creature space. In contrast, you can move through a hostile creature space only if the creature is at least two sizes larger or smaller than you. And that came up in this um, session, too. So uh, We were fighting a giant crab, which is huge. And um, then somebody turned into a centipede and wanted to move through its space. And, you know, we I, I was like, well, okay, yeah, because we could do like the halfling rule. But here it is. You know, I, hadn't, I wasn't even looking right here. Um, remember that another creature space is difficult terrain for you. Whether a creature, and that's important too, difficult terrain. So it shortens how much you can get in there and get back out. Whether a creature is a friend or an enemy, you can't willingly end your move in its space. Move, not turn. Very important. Um, then, of course, if you leave a hostile creature's reach during your move, you provoke an opportunity attack, as explained later in the chapter. And again, that was on page 191. So you get so much movement. And like if you get 30 feet of movement per turn, you know, you can move 15 or you can, it's a pool. You can spend 10 feet of it now, take an action then spend another 20 feet or you can move five feet, take an action then move another 25 feet. Or, or whatever. You don't have to spend it all at once. But if you move 10 feet, that's a move. Right? If you don't use up all your uh, movement and then you stop and do something, that's the end of that move. Now you can move again. But So what this is saying is you can't, if you have a grid full of friendly characters and you run into them to get to the enemy who's, you know, um, you know, there's only so much room, you know, for the marching order to have people directly confronting the enemy. You can't run up there to where your allies are, fight, and then jump back. It, it just doesn't work that way. And, I mean, we've been playing like that for probably a couple of years. So I want to clarify that. Uh, that was from Jeremy Crawford. Like I said, you can house rule it differently, but that's the official ruling. Um, however, I'm, I'm going to go with the official ruling, um, you know, for the time being, unless... You know, I hear a good case otherwise. So I already talked about the small creature. The Druid turned into a centipede and went through a huge huge creature's um, space. That's fine. And then another thing I did this round or this um, session, which is kind of counterintuitive to me saying I wanted to speed things up with it's a larger group, was I uh, started rolling initiative every, every round just because I wanted to see what it would be like, you know, Greyhawk initiative does that castles and crusades does that. And it adds kind of a good mix because you don't know who's going to go net, uh, in what order on the next term or on the next round. So if the, if the initiative stays static, then, you know, I'm always going to go right after the bad guy until he's dead or whatever, or I'm always going to go right before him. So that, that changes your whole stat strategy or that, that affects your whole strategy and tactics. But if you don't know from round to round when you're going and when the bad guys are going, that can change things up a little bit and add some tension and drama. So I wanted to uh, kind of play around with that. Um, I'll probably keep doing that unless it just turns into a big problem. 
Uh, now we did. We were running out of time in this last session while we were fighting the crab. So I just said, look, the um, uh, you know this we went like three or four rounds of combat with the giant crab. And the last, I said, we're not going to roll initiative on this last one. We're just going to plow ahead, you know, just so that we can, um, you know, get to a certain point at the, by the end of this session. So we did that. Those are kind of some of the, the rules and, 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 and things that came up or, or things that I tinkered with. Now, they were at um, basically just south of Area 14, which is the flood doors. And they're about to get up into the flood doors. So let me... Read you area 14, and these are three flood doors that are in a row going north um, just before you get to the uh, boy, the underground lake and the magic bubble and all that stuff. So 14 flood doors. The three doors along the corridor are made of thick, are made of thick metal, their edges flanged so that they overlap the door jam on the north side and thus can be opened only by pivoting them to the north. The north side of each door has a handle so they can be pulled open from that direction. These barriers are emergency doors whose purpose is to prevent the dungeon from being flooded by the boiling lake at Area 15 in case of a quote-unquote accident. So, of course, my players are thinking trap because they started thinking about the uh, turnstile that is is just before you get to the 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 boiling mud that has the the discs and the chains and the geysers before you get to the vampire and whelm and all that. So they're they're thinking trap. So I mean they're just really checking these doors out. And they're asking all kinds of questions. Uh, and another thing, you know, I, I guess in my mind I assumed that the doors were open uh, to begin with. I don't know why I thought that, but the map surely clearly shows that they're closed so these are closed so they encounter one door and then another door after that one another door after that one but the dynamics of all the doors are the same um so and one of the players after i described it and they kind of messed around I actually made a really good guess he's like this kind of seems like it's to seal water in or something like that or protect from a flood um but the they the the party as a whole was really suspecting a trap and they ended up uh Getting the, keeping the doors open by opening them all the way to, to where they basically hit the side of the corridor. And then they, you know, at the bottom of the door, they, they had some pittance kind of, and they spiked the doors open because they're really suspecting a trap. And, I mean, they were asking me all kinds of questions. They were like, how thick are these doors? And I think it actually, uh, did it answer how thick they are? Uh, do, do, do. Yeah, it doesn't even say how it just says thick metal. Um, they want to know exactly how they pivoted. You know, I was kind of just saying, well, I guess they pivot, right? Pivot in the center to open north because you usually don't pivot from one end. You usually pivot kind of in the middle, but I don't know that for sure. I'm just going by that brief description in the book. Um, how big is the pivot? Where is the pivot? How deep into the wall and ceiling does the pivot go? Uh, they, they were coming at this these doors from like this engineering perspective you know in fact one of those like one of my players like, i got an engineer background you know and and they're coming at these doors and, and frankly you just don't have enough information from the book to really go into super big detail on these doors um so it kind of drove me nuts a little bit and uh you know i was trying to answer the questions the best i could but i also felt like they were kind of you know going off on a wild goose chase kind of a little bit of a tangent with these doors um, being, you know, they were like really worried about a trap, which I don't blame because this is a dangerous dungeon, but at the same time, I didn't want them to spend an hour on these doors, right? So I, I basically said, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. And I read them the description, the entire description for Fort Area 14, except for it says these barriers are emergency doors and whose purpose is that last paragraph I didn't read, but everything else, you know, uh, I read and I read it to him and I said, now, you know, as much as I do about these doors, I said, I know nothing else about the doors. Now, you know, I, I'm sure some DMs are like, oh, no, 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 you should have been more descriptive and imaginative and this and that and the other. But I just wanted to make the point to him that, you know, that's this is all there is to these doors, uh, you know, and, and let's kind of keep moving because I had a certain point 
that I, I wanted to get to. And again, I, we play at a store, it closes at a certain time, and there's a drop dead time we have to stop. And there was a point I wanted to get to by the end of the session. So to speed things along, and I guess every DM does this sometimes, I just said that's everything that there is to, that, that I can share with you about these doors. And, you know, a couple of players were like, yeah, we're – we're, we're spending way too much time on these tours, but there was one or two players who were just like really into the doors. So I would, you know, play how you want. If you, if you just want to have a night of comedy and, and spend three hours on the doors, you're welcome to. I, I, I decided to save their sanity and mind and, and kind of make it clear that, you know, what you see is what you get on the doors. There doesn't seem to be anything nefarious. Um, but they spiked all three of them open because they were really worried about getting trapped somewhere. Uh, even though, you know, maybe there, the doors weren't locked, you know, you could easily open them from the north side. You could pivot them open from the south side, you know, all of that. So, uh, but that, that turnstile got into their brain, you know, as far as like, we don't want to get somewhere we can't get back out of, which is good. That means they took that, you know, the, the turnstile was really a major effect on them as far as the game design of this uh, adventure goes. So where they come to is they go north and they come to uh, the Boiling Lake, um, and there's also kind of a blowhole related to this to this Boiling Lake that they did not encounter, but I will read um, areas 15 and 16 for you so you'll know kind of what's going on here. Now, area 15 said so this Boiling Lake is several hundred feet deep. And this is on page 102 and 103 in the adventure. Um 15 says, the spoiling lake is several hundred feet deep, extending down to the red-hot rock below um, and reaching nearly to the ceiling of the cavern it occupies, 50 feet above the level of the sunken ledge described in Area 17. So the ceiling is 50 feet up from the sunken ledge that the players will go out to when they're confronting the crab and trying to get well. Um, and that's Area 17. It is fed by an underground stream that enters from the northwest as the depth of 100 feet below that of the ledge so that it's fed by a stream that's actually way below the ledge that you're going to be on. Um, it's runoff flows through a channel to the east above the ledge near the ceiling of the cavern. Any creature that enters the boiling lake or has the boiling lake flood in on them or whatever takes 44, this is in parentheses, 8d10, so the average damage of that is 44, but 8d10 fire damage immediately and again at the start of each of its turns for as long as it remains in the lake. So the lake, for all, unless you have fire protection or some sort of special ability or spell or something going on, magic item, the lake is pretty much insta-death within two or three turns. Some characters may be insta-death immediately. Um, you know, you could if you rolled the damage, you could potentially roll up to 80 points in one round. Average damage is 44 per turn. Uh, or, you know, 80 in one turn, 44 average, right? So it's pretty, this is a, de this lake is deadly is the point. Now, area 16, this is a nice little game design moment um, for this module. The runoff from the boiling lake cascades down through a series of near vertical lava tubes to the base of the blowhole 800 feet below the level of the dungeon where the water strikes molten rock and is in, or it says there the water strikes molten rock and is instantly converted to steam. It is ejected up the blowhole and out the top of the volcanic cone, forming the continuous geyser of White Plume Mountain. The boiling water here is just as dangerous as the water in Area 15. So that's a nice little touch explaining why there's a constant little plume, you know, going off of the mountain. I, I think that's really cool that they did that. Um, I'm going to look in here. There's a cross section of the mountain. Yep, there's the blowhole. Yeah, there's a cross section. I'll try to put that image up so you can kind of see how it looks in a cross section um, of the whole dungeon, which is kind of neat. And that's on page 97 of Tales from the Yawning Portal. So that's uh, areas. That's that's kind of what's around the boiling bubble. Uh, before you get to the boiling bubble and confront the crab. Okay, so this crab, the boiling bubble, and this is one of the areas that's in the poem, that's alluded to in the poem that you can get at the beginning of the adventure. It talks about, a, I think, a 
beast in a bubble or something like that. Um, this is area 17. So let's go to area 17, which is on page 103. We'll read this whole thing to you, give you the setup. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a little bit of a longer entry, but you know, that's what we're here for is to learn how to run this module along with getting DM thoughts and all that stuff. So here we go. 17, the boiling bubble, a sunken stone ledge projects out into the boiling lake. The corridor from the dungeon continues out into the lake under a magical force field that keeps out the water by forming a sort of elastic skin. It's not literally elastic. It's not literally plastic or anything. There's no plastic in D&D, but it's a force field that kind of feels that way. The shape of the corridor is not square in cross-section like the rest of the dungeon, but rather a semicircular but rather semicircular, as if a series of hoops were supporting the ceiling. So it goes from being, you know, to, hmm, because now you're under this force field. The protective skin is soft, resilient, and uncomfortably warm to the touch. Under any pressure, it immediately becomes taut, and, un and any character unwise enough to puncture it with a piercing weapon will cause a stream of scalding water to rush into the corridor, hopefully burning the idiot, and that's exactly what the book says, hopefully burning the idiot who made the hole um, for 1d4 fire damage or an average of 2. Thereafter, any creature that enters the space with this stream of scalding water or that starts its turn there takes that damage. The skin will not heal, in quotes, once it is compromised. Major damage to the skin, as from a slash with the sword or an axe, slash with a sword or an axe, will collapse the field like a deflating balloon in 1d6 rounds. This, in my opinion, is, is like really the major threat and challenge of this area, above and beyond the crab. Now, it's possible that the giant crab could do some damage to somebody, but I really feel that's the danger in here, is this whole bubble under the boiling lake situation. After 30 feet, this corridor gives way to an oval-shaped, domed area enclosed by the protective skin. Here lives the guardian of the treasure, a huge, giant, huge, giant crab that has the following changes, which increase its challenge rating to 8, uh, or 3,900 XP. Now, normally, a, a giant crab is not huge. I think it's just large. So this is a huge, giant crab. Go compare the monster manual stats for the giant crab. To this it's quite a bit different it has 161 or 14 d12 plus 70 hit points its strength and constitution are 20 for plus five modifiers to both one of its claws one of its claws it wears on one of its claws it wears a rune covered copper band and make that makes it immune to being charmed frightened and paralyzed the copper band is worthless as treasure for the magic is key to the to the crab and it has an improved claw, claw attack. The claw attack is plus nine to hit, 10 feet reach, can hit one target. Now you think, I, in my head, I feel like the crab should get two attacks per round, but by the book, evidently it only gets one. Uh, if it hits, it's uh, an average of 27 or 4d10 plus five bludgeoning damage, and the target is grappled. Escape, uh, and the escape from it is DC 14. The crab has two claws, each of which can grapple only one target. So, it can grapple somebody and then hit with the other claw, but it can't hit twice. It can't attack with both claws in one round, which I think it should be able to to make it more of a challenge. The crab will intelligently attack intruders, being careful not to bump the protective skin walls. The crab is experienced in fighting in this manner, as is evidenced by the bones scattered about, but the characters are not. You will have to watch for characters whose actions might rip the water skin, especially any foolish enough to use two-handed weapons or a violent spell such as fireball or lightning bolt. Such people are likely to get the whole party boiled. Treasure. At the north end of the domed area is a heavy chest firmly attached to the floor, and it is Wave, a sentient trident. See sample sentient items in Chapter 7 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. We'll get them that later in the video. 
uh, a thousand gold pieces in small sacks, 20 gems, two big ones worth a thousand gold pieces each, uh, one big one worth 5,000 gold pieces, and 17 others worth a total of uh, 3,935 gold pieces. Goggles of night and a stone of good luck. What's up, buddy? Can you help me read this? <laughs> We'll be back after these messages. Um, let me uh, let me read one more thing here, and then I'll help you with that, buddy. All right. So also, here's a development. A character who grabs Wave while the protective skin is collapsing can save the lives of those nearby by using the Trident as a cube of force. Wave will instantly make its bearer aware of this property and allow the bearer to instantly become attuned to it if that person worships a god of the sea or is willing to convert on the spot. Characters protected by the cube will probably end up being blown out of the geyser at the top of the mountain. Um, the airfield cube will float, drain down the cascade, and be ejected from the plume, a rocky ride. Characters could also survive the boiling lake by some combination of immunity, fire damage, and the ability to breathe water. So that is Area 17. We'll be back to that here in a second as soon as I help my son with his urgent project here. What are we doing? We're looking at some space thing. Okay. I'll be back instantly for you, maybe a few minutes for me. Okay, we're back, and we are joined, as you can see here, by by the junior Shane Plays, junior DM. So, um, okay. So, basically, uh, with the boiling bubble area, here's some changes I made. I did, I increased the giant crab, crab to 200 uh, hit points from 161, and I also increased it to AC 16 um, over AC 15. So that, those were a couple of things I did with the um, the crab to make it a little bit more of a challenge. Now, one thing I, I really kind of feel like I should have done is to give it two attacks, but I didn't. Um, I think that would have been for the size of my group uh, and their you know their ability to handle challenges. Uh, I, th I think that, you know, giving it two, two attacks would not have been out of the question. I also, in the treasure area, I, um, let's see if I can find my notes here. I didn't, I, I removed the gems and the gold pieces um, and basically just gave them wave and the, the goggles of night and the, and the stone of good luck because gem and gold piece wise they've made a fortune in this dungeon already they're only six level about to be seventh level and they're just they're rolling in money uh so you know i just, I just didn't really feel like they needed that much more than than they've already gotten so um that was just kind of a kind of a personal choice so um those were some changes i made now the crab fight itself uh, it just so happened that the crab won initiative so um, and that, you know, it, it, it allowed the crab to, to run up and block the corridor coming into the big oval. So that really controlled the dynamics of the fight a lot in the crab's favor, uh, because it, you know, it controlled that little area. There was, there was, there was only two, uh, five by five spaces right in front of it that a character could be in physically fighting it. And it had a reach to where it could get to the front two rows of of the of the marching order, basically fighting it. So that, I think that was a pretty powerful um, strategy for the crab to just run up and block that, so they can't get through it. Now the druid at one point, about three rounds in, did you know use a bonus action to turn into a giant centipede and, and go through its space and get behind it. Uh, but other than that, it pretty much controlled the the placement of the battle and was just you know hammering on people. So I did rule, uh, yeah, this was, there was only two abreast in front of the crab with a force field on either side, very tightly, you know, once you get out into the, the bubble proper, uh, you know, the, the domed bubble, then you've got a little bit more room to fight and fumble and this and that and the other, but they were right there in that corridor with the force field literally on either side of them and just above them. Um, and so I ruled that there was a 50% chance to slash the bubble if you fumbled uh, with a slashing or piercing weapon while standing in the tunnel, uh, right there fighting the crab, still in the tunnel, in the corridor, not able to get out into the larger area because the crab's blocking that that movement into the, the larger bubble area. And it just so happened that in both squares that um, 
not only did they fumble with a piercing or slashing weapon, but they also ruled the 50% that would be needed. You know, I, I basically said take percentile dice. Is it a high or low? And both of them said, well, if I roll above 50%, then it slashes. And both of them rolled above 50%. So each each square on either side, so both sides of the tunnel force field right in front of the, the crab, the entrance to get into the big oval area, got slashed and punctured and water started pouring in. Now, one thing that I did do um, is I increased the amount of damage from the, I, I think the book says 1d4, an average of two. I made it 2d8 uh, because again, you know, the crab itself is not a major challenge for, for this party. And I knew it, the crab would not be a major, I thought it might take one character to unconsciousness, but you know, I knew they would defeat it. And, you know, they stand to grant to get wave the final major weapon and, and, and goal of this, this whole dungeon, this classic dungeon. So, uh, I made the, um, the damage from the, the, the water. Like if you, if you on purpose punctured it or accidentally punctured it, whatever, if there's a puncture and the water is pouring in the book says one D four, uh, average of two damage. I said two D eight, which I guess what would be the average damage there somewhere around eight, uh, somewhere in there. So, um, so that's what I had happen. And you, and you literally had a case where, um, you had both, both grid squares, there, spaces, you had water pouring in, uh, and, and doing 2d8 damage if to anybody was in there. And I made it, if you, if you ended your turn there, or if you entered that, you know, you, now you wouldn't take the damage twice in one turn. Like if you entered it and then entered your, ended your turn there, I didn't make it. So you took the damage twice, but either occurrence would trigger the damage. If you ran through the water you got the damage. So it, it actually, at one point, the crab, like uh, the main dwarven fighter was trying to get out of the square and on a, uh, a attack of opportunity, the, uh, the crab hit him and grappled him and kept him there. So for two or three rounds, the, the, gra- the, the crab in the claw just kept the dwarf under the water as the water kept pouring in on him. So that was kind of you know, kind of a nice move on the, on the crabs part. Uh, also, you know, I, you do roll a D six to determine how many rounds down the road. If you, you know, if you puncture like strongly puncture the force field and the first thing, um, I think I rolled a four on the first fumble and then the second fumble, I think I just left it at four rounds till it started collapsing because, you know, it, it gets to the point where, you know, I do want them to have a chance to get wave and I don't want them to automatically die. So I just, in my head, I knew that about four rounds, uh, into the battle, you know, things were going to start. And I wasn't going to have it collapse immediately. I was going to have it, you know, okay, this, it, this thing's about to, you're seeing major signs that this bubble's about to collapse, which would give them a couple of more rounds or whatever to do something and then get out of there. Um, so I did that, uh, but I, I was actually kind of glad about the, f- I didn't want them to fumble. I don't want them to die and all that, but I was glad it happened naturally without me forcing it as a DM because it added, you know, some more tension and excitement to the encounter. Again, the crabs was not going to be a major challenge. Now, one thing I did rule, it, uh, one of my um, characters asked about, can I use the mending spell on this force field? And my initial thought was like, well, no. Because that's like, that's almost like a, is it a first level spell or a cantrip or something like that? Let's see here. Um, let's look up mending. Page 259. It's a cantrip. And I just didn't see a, a cantrip completely altering the entire flavor of this whole encounter. But to be fair, I went and looked it up. And uh, so this spell requ- repairs a single break or tear in an object you touch such as a broken chain link, two halves of a broken key, a torn cloak, or a leaking wineskin. As long as the break or tear is no larger than one foot in any dimension, you mend it, leaving no trace of the former damage. This spell can physically repair a magic item or construct, 
or the construct, but the spell can't restore magic to such an object. Just based on that description, this force field is so weird. I don't even know if it's a construct or not. I don't know what technically qualifies as a construct. But I personally ruled and said, no, you can't fix this with a mending cantrip. It wasn't a bad question. If I was a player, I would have asked the same thing. But, you know, there's so many areas... Uh, that have like this advanced engineering or advanced magic in White Plume Mountain that are beyond the normal magic of, 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 of regular spells and stuff for D&D. So between the crabs doing its thing, hitting hard, uh, and the water pouring in, and this and that and the other, you know, it was a bit of a challenge. There was some hit points delivered out. I think of a healing spell or two hadn't been cast that, you know, a character would have at least gone unconscious, but ultimately they defeated the crab. And what I did is I said, you know, as the crab died, I, I basically said it's obvious that these slashes on either side of the force field here in this corridor are growing and that this, this force field is becoming unstable and there's more and more water pouring in. Uh, so basically uh, three different things happened. A couple of players started because there's a chest that's obviously once the crab dies and all that, they see there's a chest in the oval area that is secured to the floor and a couple of characters ran for that uh you know because they know that that's probably where the the prize the booty the loot is which is true another a couple other players started running for the flood doors because they realized okay now we know what those doors were for and we've got to undo our spiking and and get them so we can close at least one of them so they started pell-melling that way to do that and of course i had the one player that really wanted the band that, that band that's on the claw of the crab that makes it immune to certain, you know, like charms and frightened and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, and it's, it's got like runes inscribed all over it. Uh, wanted it really bad to the, to the point where they were, you know, kind of risking their life trying to get this thing off of the, the craw, off the claw, um, you know, before the bubble crashed down. And, you know, it, it, there had been a giant snake summoned by the druid in the middle of this fight. And the giant snake evidently was beating on the claw, trying to break the claw off. And there was this whole thing about getting that band off the claw, which, of course, players will do. So um, I did have uh, the the players, you know, they checked the traps. They checked or did a super quick check for traps on the chest there isn't any they found they open it up and they got wave they got the stone of good luck and they got the night goggles uh, and i've already said before i didn't i didn't put the go, i didn't put the gold pieces in the gems before i mean they've already gotten a lot of loot from this um gems and gold and stuff from this dungeon from their for their level um you know the the player with the band that wanted to band was trying to get off and finally gave up on that um and and so then all those players that were still in the oval you know, I mean, I'm, I'm like, okay, the bubble's coming down. I mean, it's, you know, I call it the Indiana Jones scene. You know, they got to run for their lives for these doors. And, and, you know, so I was playing it for tension. And so there was that giant snake I mentioned a second ago that the druid had summoned. And he actually, uh, when it when it's obvious everything's just crashing down and everything, and, and you know, it's it's do or die time. It's get out of their time. Uh, he had actually said, I'm going to I'm going to have my giant snake sacrifice itself and wedge itself in that area against both of the slashes. And so what I it, all what that accomplished was because it's not going to keep everything from crashing down. And I mean, this is a very dangerous moment for the characters uh, and the players and everything. And because this boiling water does so much damage. And they. um you know, they ran for the doors, so I, I was, you know, I was like, okay, it's going to be a difficulty 10, uh, DC 10, which I thought was fairly fair, average check, athletics, because it's running, to make the doors in time before the water hits you. And because of the snake thing, I said, okay, it'll be with advantage. So I felt they had a pretty good chance of making it to the doors without dying, but at the same time, you know, they're the ones that stayed behind in this unstable situation to check things out. So no risk, no risk, no reward kind of thing, right? Or the greater the risk, the greater reward. So um, I, I, you know, I did, man, I said, you know, they've, got, they've gotten a couple of the the doors unspiked, you know, because they, you know, they're over there talking, eh, get them off. So, you know, they can get at least one or two of the, the flood doors closed. That's not a problem. Um, so they ran and every player except one made it. And the one that didn't make it 
rolled a nine, so only missed it by one. So the way I ended up going with it, first of all, if a character or a player, whatever, had been caught, didn't make their check and got caught in the crashing water and had been holding Wave, then Wave would make its offer, you know, like convert to the worship of the gods of the sea and I'll save you. You know, Cuba Force, out you go, like is described when I read Area 17. But that wasn't the case. The only character that didn't make their throw was the same one that was like tugging, trying to get the band, you know, the gold band or, or the not the gold band, but the the copper band or whatever it is, basically the ring, the crab's ring that's keyed only to the crab. So even if you take it, it's only worth the metal or whatever, um, or the sentimental value. Um, I guess it, he missed by one, by a nine. So if they, had, basically I was going to say, if you miss, you know, you're, it's basically ends to death because the door is going to slam shut and you're going to be trapped in all that water going in on you. And unless you have some spell or ability or something, it allows you to survive, which it didn't sound like any of them did. They were talking about their options once they realized they were running a boiling lake. Um, but since they took it, rolled a nine, and that was almost but not quite, I let them, they took one full round worth of damage, you know, the, the 8d10. And I think I actually rolled it out, and it was below average. It was like 30-something points. So they took a hit and barely got pulled in. Right. They, they got pulled in the door shut, but, you know, right in their back, they got a full hit of that hot water before they got pulled in and the door was slammed shut. So um, that's kind of how I how I played that, you know, kind of a nice Indiana Jones trying to outrun the the crushing heat wave of tidal hot flaming water of doom or, or whatever. So I thought that was kind of fun. It was kind of an exciting moment. Um, so everybody else made it. And uh, or everybody made it, period. Uh, one of them by the very skin of his teeth, and they did get wave. Uh, so now they've they've captured all three, re- recovered all three weapons. Although Black Razor, it's Black Razor's fate is unknown at this point, even though they did they did recover it from the dungeon. So what, what I want to do at this point is I want to read um, Wave's stats to you from the Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, and I want to say it, it, up to this point in the game, nobody has tried to attune to wave because they haven't had a long or short rest yet but nobody's it doesn't sound like that any players are particularly wanting to attune to wave um which was interesting um i've actually been kind of interesting in in the group's lack of interest in wave and black razor they really you know i played i role played black razor to the point where they're like this sword's a jerk and we don't want anything to do with this sword which is really kind of what the sword's all about Wave, the Trident, I thought there would be more interest in, you know, uh, and I, I did role play Wave, um, as I, I said, he's got this uh, powerful but sort of watery voice, and he's always asking characters who they serve and telling them they should consider the sea deities, which is his personality, he's like, may I ask you who you worship? And let me tell you of the uh, of the of the gods of the sea, because that's his personality, as you'll see from the DM's guide. So let me grab that real quick, and we will uh, we'll go over everything about Wave. All right, so this is Dungeon Master's Guide, page two eighteen. Here's Wave, um, and it, you know, as a reminder, and this is from page two sixteen through two eighteen. Uh, Black Razor, Wave, and Whelm are all in the Dungeon Master's Guide because they're just they're famous uh, weapons from uh, D&D history. So they're important enough to be in the Dungeon Master's Guide. So uh, let's take a look here. Wave, it's a weapon trident, legendary, and it requires attunement by a creature that worships a god of the sea. Held in the dungeon of White Plume Mountain, this trident is an exquisite weapon engraved with images of wave shells and sea creatures. Although you must worship a god of the sea to attune to this weapon, wave happily accepts new converts. You gain a plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon. If you score a critical hit with it, the target takes extra necrotic damage equal to half its hit point maximum. Ouch! The weapon also functions as a trident of fish command and a weapon of warning. It can confer the benefit of a cap of water breathing while you hold it, and you can use it as a cube of force by choosing the effect instead of pressing cube sides to select it. Sentience. Wave is a sentient weapon of neutral alignment. 
With an intelligence of 14, a wisdom of 10, and a charisma of 18, very high charisma, it has hearing and dark vision out to a range of 120 feet. The weapon communicates telepathically with its wielder and can speak, read, and understand Aquan. It can also speak with aquatic animals as if using a speak with animals spell, using telepathy to involve its wielder in the conversation. Personality. When it grows rest restless, Wave has a habit of humming, humming tunes that vary from sea chanties to sacred hymns to the sea gods. Wave zealously desires to convert mortals to the worship of one or more sea gods, or else to consign the faithless to death. Conflict arises if the wielder fails to further the weapon's objectives in the world. The trident has a nostalgic attachment to the place where it was forged, a desolate island called Thunderforge. A sea god imprisoned a family of storm giants there, and the giants forged Wave in an act of devotion to or rebellion against that god. Wave harbors a secret doubt about its nature and purpose. For all its devotion to the sea gods, Wave fears that it was intended to bring about a particular sea god's demise. This destiny is something that Wave might not be able to avert. So that's Wave. Um, and, you know, all, all three of these weapons from Bl White Plume Mountain have distinct and interesting personalities. They're all sentient. So Black Razor to the point where, you know, you really don't, it's, it's just kind of, ugh, this, this thing is, you know, if it claims not to be evil, uh, I think it's like the ultimate neutral, if I remember right, because it's, oh, let's see if I can take a look here. Um, it's like, it's like the ultimate neutral because it just wants to devour everything and bring about the heat death of the, uh, let's see, what's its personality? It doesn't, well, I guess it doesn't say, I thought it did give its alignment. Do, 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 do. So it just can't be a non-lawful alignment to attune with it. But I thought it gave its own, yeah, it's chaotic neutral, which is, you know, it's, it's not even evil. It just doesn't care about anything. So anyway, that's enough about Black Razor. We're talking about Wave. So that's Wave. And I did make it so that in the book pretty much says this, all three of these weapons, even though their, um, their personalities and purposes in the world are different, they like to be together. Like Black Razor, even though it doesn't like Wave and Whelm, it wants to be with them. So, I, you know, I had Whelm and Wave were happy to see each other and were kind of chatting with each other. And, you know, Whelm, of course, the players like because I'm playing him like, you know, Billy Connolly, you know, this kind of Scottish, you know, um, you know, hey, lad, you know, the kind of thing and just boisterous and lusty battle dwarf kind of hammer and warhammer and, and everyone likes Whelm. So. Uh, or way, yeah, Whelm, and then Wave, like I said, speaks with, I got him sort of speaking with a powerful, but sort of a watery voice. Um, okay, so after they got Wave, they were they were going to head to Burkett and Snarla's area after the spinning cylinder, because they wanted to lock themselves in there and take a long rest, but what I did was I sprung Nox on them, and Nox is in a freet, so let me read, and this is an optional encounter that you can do, um, but if it, basically the book says, uh, for Tales from the Awning Portal on page, uh, let's see here. Um, oh, yeah, Escaping the Dungeon on page 107. It says, if the characters obtain two or even all three of the magic weapons and are leaving for good, it's up, you know, they're leaving for good, uh, they might be stopped at area two. Now, I didn't make it area two. I, I did it at a different area because I wanted to catch them before they took a long rest to make the battle more interesting. Um, a wall of force will block them in. I didn't even have that happen. I just had them walking and the voice. But it says, if you do it by the book, they might be stopped at area two by the return of the wall of force, which is, I guess, where the, the Sphinx is at uh, that you have to do the riddles with. Uh, a voice will speak to them out of the air. Not thinking of leaving, are you? You've been so very entertaining. I just couldn't think of letting you go, especially with those little items of mine. And since you've eliminated all of their guardians, why, you'll simply have to stay to take their places. I'll have to ask you to leave all of your ridiculous weapons behind, 
and let Nixon Knox escort you to the indoctrination center. I'll be most disappointed if you cause me any trouble. And Nixon Knox have to eliminate you. Don't worry, you'll like it here. So there's a couple of things going on here. One, it implies that it's Coraptus. Uh, you know, the the wizard who built this uh, dungeon, you know, finally revealing himself. Ha ha, now that you've, you know, conquered the dungeon, you're going to become a part of it. Mo ha ha ha, you know, my evil plan. And then also there's a couple of Afridis that are both CR11. Uh, you can sick them on the players. Now, what I wanted this encounter to be would be a little bit challenging but not the penultimate or the final. It's actually the, the penultimate encounter, even though the players don't know that. There's, I'm homebrewing the conclusion for next week's session uh, that it's going to tie a few things together that you know I've been talking about and viewers have been suggesting and stuff for, for the White Plume Mountain, how to, how to wrap things up. Now, um, again, you can, uh, you can, you know, the book even says the whole episode can be admitted, admitted, oh, omit, omitted, not emitted. If the party's already taken too, not, too much damage, uh, conversely, if the characters have had too easy of a time of it, this final challenge can be made tougher by the addition of one or two or more free called box and Cox. So you got Nix and Knox and Box and Cox. If for some foolish reason the party decides to comply with Caraptus's request and go with Nix and Knox to the quote-unquote indoctrination center, you will have to play it by ear. It's not too difficult. Use your imagination and make it up as you go. Just make sure the characters are extremely sorry they ever decided to submit to Caraptus's demands. They probably will end up as the brainwashed new guards in Caraptus's renewed version of White Plume Mountain's dungeon. Yeah, the, the indoctrination center is never... Um, detailed fleshed out now maybe other adventures have done that or i know there's like a ret return to plight plume mountain maybe there's already some stuff out there but the basic adventure doesn't have information on the indoctrination center and as a matter of fact area oh um nine where they kind of go down underwater and turn the wheel and let the water drain out that also supposedly has a secret door that goes to the indoctrination center that i just pull i didn't even want to mess with that I didn't even say, way, buddy, say hi, say hi. So I didn't even want to mess with that at all. So, um, and, and I'll, I'll tell you what I did with, um, with, with this is one I had just one free D attack because they're CR 11 and, you know, they can be pretty tough under the right circumstances. I didn't want to put two CR 11 creatures on them right after fighting the giant crab and all that. And plus, you know, we were getting close to the end of the session. So, um, you know, and, 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 and there's, I still have a battle to come that will be tougher than the Afridi. Uh, now in my personal lore, this is, doesn't have to be your lore, but my personal lore, Karaptus is no longer there. Uh, the dungeon has basically been running on auto with magic and commands Karaptus put into place before he died. Very powerful wizard. So it, it renews itself. It, it, you know, it, it brings food in it for the creatures. I mean, it does all this stuff and it renew, it resets itself if a party leaves and comes back and all this stuff. And that also has kind of shown after all this time, you know, that uh, I kind of ad libbed that the, in previous videos that the flesh golem room finally, you know, kind of had a, had a bug and, and didn't reset itself. Uh, and it also, the riddle didn't work right. And I, I had to do that to kind of ad lib because a player blurted out the answer after I said, don't do that. But that's a few videos back. So, um, I think another thing that would be interesting to do if you really wanted to take this further and, you know, have them captured or have them trying to find the indoctrination center or go deeper into the dungeon or whatever is Karaptus has actually become possibly a lich. I think that would be very interesting, but I think in my personal lore, Karaptus has gone, either he's gone or he's a lich and he's gone somewhere else. Uh, I think is kind of how I'm playing it in my own personal lore. What is that, buddy? Is that Optimus Prime? That's Optimus Prime. And I guess Optimus, it's not, I guess Optimus Prime was in the dungeon too. So the Afridi fight, I, you know, go look up the stats. It's, 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 uh, and, and, and again, this is an optional encounter. It's a CR 11 encounter. Uh, you know, a couple of things about the Afridi, they have, they are kind of tough on their own, but they have, they're innate spellcasters and a couple of things that they can do that they could really change the dynamics of a fight is they can conjure a fire elemental out of fire and they can also cast the wall of fire spell and the wall of fire spell in a 
smaller area. We were in a ten by in a ten cor- ten by ten corridor, right? Ten wide, ten high. Uh, you know, because I I had the Afridi attack them before they made it to where they wanted to go, Snarla and, and Burkett's area from the previous video. Um, he cast a wall of fire. Not only did he catch a character in that wall of fire and do a lot of damage to him, but the wall of fire, you choose a side and one side of it projects intense damaging heat out for 10 feet in front of it. And if you, you know, if you end your turn or enter that or whatever, you could take a lot of fire damage. So that really kind of, he, he threw that wall of fire, trapped some characters behind it, some characters in front of it. And it, uh, you know, it really kind of controlled the battlefield. Uh, another thing that that wall of fire did uh, is somebody, you know, like ran in and was, it was trying to attack him and then run back out. So they didn't get caught in the heat effect in front of the wall of fire and fumbled. And I said, well, you dropped your short sword and basically, while that heat effect from the wall of fire was going on, you know, it was as if um, there was a heat metal effect on that short sword. So also, the, that wall of fire is opaque. So depending on what side of it you're on, you can't see through it. So that, that wall of fire is a very interesting spell that I use to my advantage in close quarters to really mess up the party. Now, they still, you know, for the most part, took the Afridi down pretty quick. Um, but one of the reasons was is because they... The, the, the Afridi lost concentration at one point and that wall of fire went down. If that wall of fire had stayed up, it, it might have been a different story. It would have been a much more challenging fight. Again, I didn't want this fight to be super deadly. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to trigger that. I like the narrative thematic effect of this. Oh, you're leaving, are you? Not so fast. And then, you know, the Afridi's attack or whatever, and it gives that kind of super villain, <laughs> you know, uh, Karaptus finally reveals himself, even though he didn't, it was kind of a pre-recorded message, but anyway, that's where, we're, I mean, we finished the fight, we're done, so they got to get out of the dungeon, I'm going to let them get out of the dungeon without any further encounters, that other party is no longer going to be there, uh, they were there for, like, dramatic effect or whatever, uh, they may show back up in the, in, in the final encounter, but they're basically, uh, they're, they do have one final encounter left. And just in case any of my players are watching this, I'm not going to say what it is. But you'll find out on next episode. Thanks so much for watching the uh, sh- this this uh, episode of the Shane Plays White Plume Mountain Notes series. Uh, please leave the uh, this video a thumbs up and a comment. That helps me out tremendously. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We'll catch you next time on Shane, Shane Plays and Son. I'm going to rename the channel Shane Plays and Son. So we'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching.